But welcome everyone. It's my my honor and pleasure. Hopefully you able to hear me uh, well. Um, it's something I don't uh, uh, take for granted in my role as um, a, a teacher, a good listener, I hope, um, and uh, a user of technologies such as we are doing at this very moment. So um, I am honored to introduce Marcia Jenneth Epstein, a musicologist and cultural historian in the Faculty of Arts from the University of Calgary. Her interest in the ways music and noise influence the health of people and communities led to this book, Sound and Noise, A Listener's <laughs> Guide to Everyday Life. Hopefully you can see that uh, as you might have guessed. And um, um, the, the book is the result of a research journey for Marcia through history, health sciences, sociology, environmental science, and urban planning. I'd like to add that Marcia and I have been acquainted since um, it goes back to when I first saw the, the manuscript in progress, the publisher asked me to review it. So um, I was honored to have some uh, small amount of input on this um, uh, in the earlier stages of the book's development. But I'd also like to share that um, I dis uh, discovered acoustic ecology at the founding conference for the World Forum for Acoustic, acoustic Ecology at the Banff Center for the Arts in August 1993. And though uh, neither Marcia or I can recall meeting each other then, we were actually at this, this, this uh, conference uh, at that time. And so um, I'd like to acknowledge that um, the ideas of R. Murray Schaefer have been um, an influence uh, uh, for us in this, uh, in our, our approach to sound, our, our concern for uh, the value and the importance of listening um, as it impacts everyday life. And uh, since Murray Schaefer um, had recently passed away uh, this past August, um, uh, it would be uh, good to remember um, his influence in, and uh, Murray Schaefer's legacy in uh, influencing um, uh, uh, on an appreciation of listening sound music, the soundscape, and uh, creation of a field of interdisciplinary study for acoustic ecology. So, um, so uh, hopefully uh, we can carry on in his memory and uh, uh, build on that legacy that Murray Schaefer left us uh, as we go into the future, uh, a critical one for uh, changing our culture about sound and the role that technology has to play in our soundscape. So um, with that, uh, Marcia, welcome. Uh, glad we could be together like this finally um, in real time uh, rather than email and text. Uh, um, uh, I think your book was really, um, uh, well, I'm very happy that it was published and um, and I, I'd like to do my role in promoting it uh, because uh, it, it, it's a, as, as the subtitle suggests, it is in fact a listener's guide for everyday life. Um, there's plenty of books out. Uh, I, I would say an explosion of them uh, dealing with uh, the philosophical, the academic, uh, of course, the scientific study of sound which are really important books. And um, with that, um, I think we need to balance things out so that uh, books on sound and noise are, um, are, are reaching out to those who are not researchers or initiates of sound. And so um, I think this is um, the, the, the primary uh, value of your book uh, and not only that, it, it does it in a way that um, uh, it doesn't dumb it down. Um, so it's, it's readable, 
um, but you address uh, critical ideas um, and a, a wide swath of differing ideas. So you, uh, you do a fantastic way of um, uh, showing uh, how interdisciplinary uh, the field of sound, sound studies, ecology um, really are. And so, so I'm talking too much now. I think what I'd, I would like you to do then is um, I wondered if you might read from the, the beginning of your book um, uh, about just the scope of your study. I think on page four, you might have something, uh, some words uh, to kind of uh, start off with. Okay, I, I will say beforehand that uh, one of the motivations I had for doing all that research for years and going into the, the many facets of this subject is that I know that Murray Schaefer was always intending to address the general public and get people more interested in paying attention to sound. So I had hopes of picking up where he left off to some extent, and uh, I hope that's going to work when all of you read the book. <laughs> okay, from the beginning, part of the beginning. We become accustomed to ambient levels of domestic noise, whether the turtle shrieks and wails of small children or the intermittent soft clacking of computer keyboards. In this, we follow a pattern set by the evolution of our species and shared with other mammals. Familiar acoustic backgrounds, the everyday noises to which we are subjected on a regular basis, are relegated by the brain to a state of inattention in order to avoid fatiguing the nervous system with constant alarms. Our species evolved in the natural soundscapes of African forests and plains, loud with wind, rain, thunder, water, the calls of birds and insects, the earth-born thunder of vast herds of fixed animals, but not with traffic, aircraft, factories, leaf blowers, or rock concerts. We learn accommodation to noise from infancy with the repetitious sound stimuli to which we expose children, toys, television, listening devices. It continues with the teen who grows up loud, more about that later, encased in sound by means of earbuds. We take our listening habits into adulthood. Raised loud, we think nothing of exposing ourselves to the, the din of traffic, commuter trains, noisy factories or offices, and a whole host of sonic environmental conditions from combustion engines to cell phone conversations. Heating and cooling systems, the mechanics of modern comfort, form a constant drone in the background of our indoor lives. We learn to ignore them, but our ears, brains, and bodies nonetheless continue to react. What would happen? if we were to listen with intention. So that's one of the premises of the book, one of the questions it raises. How would our lives be different if we listened more consciously and noticed what we're hearing? Another small section from the first chapter. And if begins with two quotes, one from Murray Schaefer. The general acoustic environment of a society can be read as an indicator of social conditions which produce it, and may tell us much about the trending and evolution of that society. And another small quote from a working nurse commenting on noise in hospitals. Noise leaves no physical mess to clear up. If it were a garish color and had a powerful stench, would it have been taken more seriously earlier? So working into my first chapter. Listen, this is a guide to living with sound and especially with noise. Not constantly fighting battle against it, not inflicting it on others, not hiding it or yourself under more layers of sound. 
This is about being a listener, whatever else you also are. This is about how you listen and what you hear, as well as how you hear and what you listen to. This is about having a dialogue with the sounds around you which carry powers beyond and to hear. This is about the pain and the pleasure, the power and the danger, the science and the art of sound. This is about the cities, the medicine, the music, the children, and you. Yes, so sound in everyday life. Let's yeah. take a moment to think what everyday life means. The assumption we tend to have is that everyday life is North American, maybe European, middle class, maybe professional, and white. Not everybody lives that way. And one of the big issues I've come across with working with sound and working with noise pollution is that it's not evenly distributed. So many people all over the world living in impoverished neighborhoods in cities are exposed to far more noise than people living in suburbs or in buildings that are, are built with proper soundproofing. Soundproofing is expensive and it's one of the first things skimped on in apartment buildings. So a lot of the world lives with levels of noise just in their everyday life that can be harmful to them. It's a social justice issue. I, um, um, I do agree with that. And um, I think um, um, in my uh, activities here in Chicago, um, um, where I've um, been involved in organizing m my uh, members of my own community. Uh, my background, as you might have heard from the, the biography at the beginning, is in, in the arts and working in sound, experimental music, and so on. Um, and so that's the milieu I'm working in. Um, but we're, we're having... Um, um, uh, positive, uh, though challenging conversations about social justice. Um, I would say more specifically about how to be anti-racist. And um, in the uh, midst of the pandemic that we're in and uh, in the aftermath of uh, traumatizing events such as the murder of George Floyd, um, and, and so many other things um, uh, I could list um, that um, our, our sources of anxiety, um, anger, uh, panic, um, depression, and so on. Um, I think it's, uh, it really behooves us to be aware that uh, what we do uh, with sound and how we listen, uh, what we listen, Four um, are, um, are are both um, a part of our um, uh, you might say a way to arm ourselves to do what's best, um, but also to find uh, you know at, at when, when possible some inner, inner sense of uh, stability of peace um, uh, or um, to recharge ourselves in a situation that is very uncertain now. And um, um, I think, um, well, I can go on to elaborate, but I, I don't want to take up all the time. I'd rather have you address how you would see um, um, uh, making changes with uh, addressing, for example, well, We'll we'll start with noise pollution, uh, um, and um, obviously there's ways to measure that. You've addressed that in the book um, um, for decades now. It's been cited as a problem. We know that Murray Schaefer raised that in his earlier books on on noise, um, 
And uh, we also know um, are learning more how um, uh, disease and pollution uh, impact uh, those who are less, uh, have less advantages economically and socially. Um, uh, and so the uh, environmental degradation, degradation can be um, most impactful in a negative way for those people who are um, of color, uh, indigenous people, and so on, uh, people in the global south, too. Um, and so uh, I, we're speaking of um, mostly the non-white po population. So um, um, are there any certain um, uh, uh, points you'd like to mention where um, there's been positive change made in kind of uh, rebalancing things in a, in a more uh, uh, political, culturally positive way? Well, it's a slow process. It's happening in fits and starts in various places in the world. For example, in China, which has some of the worst noise pollution as well as air pollution in the world, they're starting to pay more attention to building residences, building apartment buildings, especially with better insulation. And technology is improving all the time for that. Insulation materials and paying attention to using absorptive materials rather than reflective ones. There's a lot of trend there has been for quite a while on metal and glass buildings that are entirely faced with glass on the inside. And those are great for visual access. And a lot of light comes in and people love it. However, glass is very noisy. So developing new formulas for it that absorb sound, that's starting to happen. And it's starting to be used. It's just that the special formulations that are involved cost a lot. So one of the, the reasons for encouraging public awareness of noise and of listening, when there is more public awareness, there will be more pressure on people building buildings and planning cities to make them friendlier to listeners so that there isn't so much background din all over the place. And we tend to tune it out as mentioned in the reading just now, because that's the way our brains work. We have to eliminate some of the signals or we would be constantly in a state of confusion. So recognizing that evolutionary principle, we need to retrain ourselves in effect to listen consciously and pay attention to when the noise is bothering us. You may notice that if you're in a room with noisy ventilation, your shoulders creep up around your ears, your neck starts to hurt, there may be a little bit of a headache, and you might get kind of snappish. Yes, it raises stress, and often we're not aware of it. So if you're working all day in a noisy place, and you find yourself getting really irritated by the end of the day, that may be one of the reasons why. All kinds of subtle effects that take quite a bit of digging, quite a bit of research to find, but yes, they're there. And it isn't even really that necessary to dig. We feel these effects all the time. That's part of everyday life. I think it's really important uh, that um, um, what you mentioned, um, and I'll, maybe I can try to recap because a few people mentioned they're having a little trouble hearing oh, your voice great. clearly. Um, better? Um, yeah, that helps a little, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The sound system is just not good. Yeah. It's if, the um, equipment, but it's not always working. Yeah, we have to struggle with that. Um, but um, if, um, if it doesn't give you a backache, <laughs> I just, okay. I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, not to laugh at that, but what we're talking about is how we can feel the physical stress, yet um, you were just saying that um, 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 the, the, the effects of, 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 of a noisy environment um, are felt by, 
by us, but we don't know just how much um, they create fatigue, you know, um, or the, 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 the effects um, um, are not, uh, we're not consciously aware of them, that's all. Um, uh, at least not immediately, although we, we might find that our mood is affected. Uh, we might be um, um, uh, having a, finding ourselves in a bad mood or, um, or uh, resorting to bad habits and bad behavior as a result of fatigue and anxiety and things. So, so it, it, it does have consequences. Um, um, but that, that is a really interesting thing about how um, we are conscious of something uh, and yet other things that are, are, might seem obvious to others and we're not conscious at all. Um, and I think that's um, something that I learned uh, was uh, at the, uh, like a, a key premise or, or maybe a, an axiom of, of listening is that it is highly subjective. And um, uh, so what I think I'm attentive towards might not be the same, even though I'm in a room with other people uh, all, and I'm believing that we are hearing the same sound. In fact, that's not the case at all. Even we're together, I hear the sound, don't you hear the sound? And someone is like, which sound? Uh, <laughs> that one sorry, I don't know which one you're speaking of. Well, how many are there? Um, you know, and they can, and, and so what I think is the sound is not the sound for someone else. Um, it's also true that people hear a little bit differently, just as we have different prescriptions for glasses or contact lenses. Our ear canals are shaped a little bit differently. I, I didn't realize that they didn't look like the, the diagrams in the textbooks. So I, <laughs> yeah. I had individual earplugs made and discovered that not only are my ear canals somewhat curly, but they're curly in different directions. And this is apparently quite common, but we never realize it because we see the charts in the textbooks that have a straight line for the ear canal. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. actually like that. Yep. Yeah. So hearing is very subjective. A lot depends on what you notice, how much density of sound is around you and how much you can separate the individual elements of it. But also things like whether you have background in music, musicians hear more acutely than people without training in music. So it's a good reason for everyone to get training in music in some way. Can you say that last sentence one more time, please? It's, it's really important for everyone to, to what? Sure. It's a good reason for everyone to get training in music in some way, even if it's just a matter of listening consciously and carefully. And trying to listen to music that you're not familiar with, we tend to stick with what we're familiar with. And there's a whole world out there, really. Uh -huh. is, is providing everyone with anything you could possibly think of from anywhere you can possibly think of. So look up a country you don't know anything about and check out their music on YouTube. It'll be there. And that may be a, a, a wonderful way to um, uh, tap into um, how um, the psychology of, uh, of a society uh, is um, um, constituted um what it responds to um the range of moods and emotions that it can sense and maybe some that are completely alien to to us um as in um uh, the ability to speak different languages you can express different ideas in different languages uh that uh, other languages might not have words uh to express a certain uh, uh, idea or experience uh, in one language than another, and uh, to the extent that language is uh, a culturally um, derived, developed um, uh, expression uh, with with sounds uh, and the body, um, uh, 
a, a culture uh, and its language and, and its music uh, are bound to be uh, you know, very uh, particular uh, and uh, and distinctly different, uh, although with many commonalities at the same time. Um, thinking about words uh, about sound, um, if you don't mind me asking, um, well, you know, I'll preface this uh, with, uh, you know, the word soundscape is, is, is fairly uh, commonplace now uh, in uh, popular uh, usage, uh, but um, uh, going back to Murray Schaefer, um, um, what I always appreciated was uh, his way of creating, uh, I think you would say neologisms uh, to combine familiar words to create a new word uh, to describe something that we hadn't had a word to describe, uh, but something that was a, a real effect or a real experience um, or phenomena. Um, and um, he created, um, you would say, a whole vocabulary uh, about sound. Yes. Yeah. So um, do you have any, can you recall any particular ones that beyond soundscape, but we most, you know, common one, there was any particular ones that you found useful? Oh, um, well, I would have to brush up on that, to be honest. Uh, just, you know, everyone be assured that when you read Murray Schaefer's work, if you haven't already, you'll find all sorts of turns of phrase that are quite wonderful, very fiercely descriptive, you might say, and <laughs> worth using. I think of um, ear cleaning was one that he used. And um, um, I also think of um, the other term from, uh, not from Murray, but from Pauline Oliveros, you know, the okay. deep listening, a whole practice um, that um, is, uh, has, uh, uh, usefulness for opening ourselves up to all the sounds that are around us and trying to be as attentive uh, to all of them as possible. Um, uh, another, because uh, you were referencing listening to music as a way to sensitize our, 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 our listening capacity. Uh, um, so um, uh, um, Murray Schaefer's ear cleaning were it was actually an, a set of exercises that were very uh, simple and, and playful um, and could be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, carried out by children and adults, um, but always uh, had a, a, a wonderful effect in, in, in uh, helping us to uh, notice uh, what we do when we listen or what we're, we're missing uh, if we're not, you know. Um, he raises very subtle questions that, that can be used to expand your sense of how to listen. And uh, he wrote several small books that, that can be used easily by school teachers and parents, how to encourage children to listen consciously and have fun doing it. We, we maybe we could share some of those at some point. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, 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 sound education, 101 exercises in sound making and listening was one of those short books. And hear sing was another one. Uh, so those should be on um, the bookshelf next to your book um, as a, as yes, a part of your your library. I'm not being subtle at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, some other things. Um, uh, so um, um, what is the extent of the, the physical impact of, uh, of sound and how it um, might be not just an annoyance, um, but um, is there, um, you know, medically uh, demonstrated impacts uh, for that? Quite a few of them actually. Um, well, one of the most direct influences that sound has on, on human health is a positive one, and that's dancing. You know, we process rhythm and it's taken in by the whole body. 
because the body and the brain are not really separate. So our nervous systems will latch onto that rhythm and mood to mood. Another positive aspect, even of noise, is that it indicates excitement. It can be used in celebration. Think of sports fields or audiences. You know, everybody gets swept up in the energy and needs to make sound in order to, to bring the excitement level up. The negative effects are also very carefully studied. And this is, yes, where medicine comes in. For example, it's now known that traffic noise, consistent traffic noise at levels average and a little bit higher and way higher, all, all of those categories, can affect the rhythm of the human heart. Small changes, it's not going to cause a heart attack, but if someone is undiagnosed and has a defect in their heart rhythm, it can push them over the edge into a danger zone. This has been studied extensively in Europe, especially in Germany. And they estimate that thousands of heart attacks happen because of traffic noise. Also, sound affects our moods, emotions, nervous system, the connection between the two. And the emotional system and the nervous system affect the immune system. So your immunity to, let's say, viruses, since we're so concerned about them right now, can be affected by the soundscape that you live in. One of the ways that noise affects people's health, of course, is by keeping us awake. So night noise is especially hazardous. Sleep interruption causes all sorts of other health problems. One of the principles that architects are now using in, well, definitely in Europe, China is catching on, so are other places in the world, but it, it's a slow process. So when you're building residences in cities, keep the bedrooms at the back of the building, not on a street with heavy traffic. That makes quite a difference. And it wasn't really recognized until the early 2000s. So city planning is learning a lot from the study of noise and the medical effects of noise. It's now known that building materials need to be up to a certain standard to reduce noise, which will affect the ability of people living in the building to sleep. And so all kinds of overlapping patterns like that you check out the traffic level, you check out what is going on with airports. Are they nearby? Are there flight patterns? Okay, let's pause there for a moment. People get used to flight patterns and people who live underneath them will say, oh, it doesn't bother me anymore. But their blood pressure is still reacting. So what we notice does not entirely determine what's happening in terms of our health. And this is where there's a tremendous amount of medical research. Another of my motivations for dealing with all these issues and putting them into a book is that this is not known by the general public. There are medical journals, medical articles, very technical. There are engineering journals and articles, again, very technical. There's very little for the public to find out, okay, what's happening with all this? The noise that goes on every day in my neighborhood, is it dangerous? Reading the medical journals, I found out that there's a lot more danger than anyone suspects. And oddly enough, it affects children. There is no regulation in most countries of the sound levels put out by toys. And in fact, toys for toddlers, for one and two year olds, their arms are not very long. So if they're holding a toy that's producing a sound, 
they're holding it close to their face, which means it's close to the ears, which means that the level of sound it's producing is generally way louder than a small child can tolerate. Their hearing is more sensitive than adults. So the question comes up, and I ask this question in the book, why is there no regulation? There should be. And this is something that the public we need to push for. This is one of those things that will not change until those questions are asked and those facts are put out to people who make laws. So let your politicians know about this. It's important. Then when children get older, they're accustomed to noise. They're accustomed to everything around them being loud, including the music their parents listen to. They get to be teenagers. And what's the stereotype we have about teenagers? They listen to loud music. Okay, why? Why is it so attractive for them? For one thing, it motivates dancing, which is a great way to work off energy when you're a teenager. It's exciting and it's group activity. You share it with other people and it's fun. So nothing wrong with that, except that the decibel levels, decibels being the measurement of loudness in sound, the decibel levels are way beyond what you would hear in a factory. And factory workers have to wear hearing protection by law. Earmuff style protectors, noise canceling headphones, that kind of thing. Airport workers, factory workers. Okay, the sound levels at most rock concerts are way beyond that. They approach the level of jet engines. And this has been steadily climbing, the level has been steadily climbing for the past couple of decades. What happens are two phenomena. One of them is called tinnitus, which is where you develop a ringing in the ears, ringing or, or rustling sound like crunching paper, which is there when you get out of the concert. It's there for a few hours, maybe for a day. You keep going back to the concerts. And after a while, the tinnitus is there permanently. There's no cure for it. There are treatments, but basically, you have ringing in your ears constantly. And yes, it affects you. So it's not something you want to get into, which means being careful, wearing earplugs at concerts. Don't stop going if you love them. But wear earplugs. They won't interfere with your enjoyment of the music. They will keep you from losing your hearing because that's the other phenomenon that happens with repeated exposure to extremely loud music. The, the cells in the inner ear that pick up sound and transmit it to the brain start to die off if they've been flattened out by excessive noise too often. And again, there's no cure for that. Every time I teach my course at University of Calgary on sound as communication, at least a few of the students there discover that they have lost some of their hearing. It doesn't mean you go totally deaf. What it does mean is that the frequency spectrum where speech is starts to dull. So it's harder to hear people's speech. It's harder to participate in conversations. And that's something that used to happen only to factory workers over the age of 50. Now it's happening to people in their 20s. So it's important to know that and to let the people around you know, your friends, your family, because this is not widely known by the general public and it needs to be. It's again, one of my motivations for producing the book. But yes, there are dangers in sound. It's even used as a weapon in crowd control. There are machines out there that broadcast extremely loud, extremely high-pitched sound or extremely low-pitched sound or both that will make people feel dizzy. It breaks up demonstrations. 
and law enforcement has been using these machines for oh, probably about the past 15 years in demonstrations that are classified as riots. Whether it's a demonstration or a riot depends a lot on what your opinion is. And the other problem is that these sound weapons will produce, produce sound that bounces off the walls of adjoining buildings, making it even louder and more chaotic. So if you think of this as a violation of individual rights, let your government know, let your police department know. I don't think they've been used in Canada at this point. Um, maybe at the G7 in Vancouver, I'd have to look that up, but several cities in the States, this has happened. And people can be caught in the sonic crossfire and again, have their hearing damaged quite quickly. So this is something that we need to be aware of. Okay, just to, to move away from that, that very dark prediction. Um, you know, it's not something most of us will ever encounter, but if you live in a large city, it could happen. Yeah. So let's, let's move on to something else. Okay, sure. Uh, um, well, maybe... back to teenagers for a moment, if, if I can just yeah. keep going. Yeah, the attraction to loud music has to do with the production of endorphins in the brain. And loud music stimulates that production, makes people feel really happy, kind of like drinking or taking drugs or dancing. And they often go together, but not necessarily. All right, this is because the more exposure you have to the loud sound, the more you need in order to reach that point of excitement. People who run clubs that play loud music tend to increase the volume steadily because they're going deaf. And so are their patrons. So it's important to recognize that the loudness has to do with excitement. And it's always a temptation to keep that excitement going. So if you're concerned about your teenagers being harmed by what they listen to, remember it's not the text of the song that's going to harm them, it's how loud they're listening to it. And if they're using earbuds, that is a direct connection almost to the eardrum. It's very close. So not a good idea. If, if you're listening on some kind of device, use the, the large earmuff type earphones. Okay, so I, that, that's my, my preaching portion of, of the talk. <laughs> Be careful about how loud you listen. Yeah. Um... We, we have a whole culture of loudness. It's, it's used for advertising. It's obnoxiously used in advertising. Yeah, um, it's... Uh... It's part of something that um, I'm, I'm referencing Murray Schaefer a lot. Um, he spoke of um, uh, sound imperialism um, or loud sounds or, um, you know, a sign of uh, in, in an industrialized nation. That's progress. You know, you can hear it. You know, the machines, the highways, the planes, the busyness um, and the business. Um, so, um, um, yeah, and um, um, it also masks all the other things, the quieter things, or the you might say the small sounds, um, whether those are, um, well, uh, we can read a lot into that, but um, uh, we have talked about uh, social justice and um, um environmental racism just a little bit before but i think 
um, we couldn't extrapolate on that easily enough. But um, what about um, change? Uh, what about um, 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 doing something if it's um, bad for us or if it's something that's um shall we say inflicted from um uh, forces outside our own control what do we do then um that's a broad question i think um because it it suggests another things you know do you mean if i'm in the club and i decide it's too loud should i just have the dj turn it down uh and ruin everyone's fun or do i uh you know what do you do or or maybe what about uh, the factory that's being built um, just down the road and um, the sound disrupting your sleep uh, at night or in your neighborhood, um, uh, creating a, a nuisance? How do you approach that? And I think in your book, you, you had some uh, sections um, and your students were involved too. Um, there was um, uh, like, I mean, there there are noise bylaws in, in most cities. You might, um, uh, for what it's worth, like to know that in Chicago, uh, the noise bylaws say that you can't play loud music past 11 p.m. And that's, that's about it. Um, um, but in other cities, it's more specific. You know, you might, uh, noise by bylaws might specify a certain level measurable in uh with meters and so on um and as well as times of day and, and things like that um but um even with measurement devices for noise i i should say sound pressure levels uh to be technical about it um even using those is not a sure way to uh get it uh get a a good uh metric on how noisy it is or how it's impacting the people in that community. Um, but anyways, you've, you've worked with your students and you address that. Could you uh, really talk about that a bit? Yes, um, there are a couple of examples in the book. One of them is local, right in Calgary. In 2007, there was a strange kind of grinding mechanical noise going on in the Northwest corner of the city. And I got curious about that, especially when people started emailing me and asking, what's going on with that noise? So I got a group together to kind of scout out the area. And we took some measurements and found out that it wasn't coming from the rail yard. It wasn't coming from the trains or the bus yard or the traffic or the compressor stations or any sort of mechanical source that we knew about. Where it was coming from was a gravel pit just outside the city. And the gravel was, was being used, or rather the, the gravel pit was home to the mechanics for making asphalt to pave the ring road, stony trail. So, we did some more investigation and I, I actually ran my my course on sound awareness the first time that year and sent a bunch of students interviewing the people at the gravel pit and the people doing the asphalt and finding out about what was going on with the paving process. It turns out that the paving had to be done at night because there was too much traffic otherwise. So the sound of the machine in the gravel pit, which was not properly located, it was supposed to be sunk into a pit so that it, it wouldn't produce as much noise. They didn't do it right, and it was sitting at ground level. So it was broadcasting this grinding noise all over this particular neighborhood, um, Royal Oak Rocky Ridge, yeah, the northwest corner. So my my investigation group started contacting the local city councilor and some of the politicians. It took about a year and a half while the paving process was going on, but they finally admitted that this had not been done properly and they changed the site of the machine 
and got a little more careful, a lot more careful about putting future gravel works and asphalt works in the area without proper insulation. So yes, the students got involved in finding out what needed to be done, checking with people in the, the noise abatement industry and came up with a, a really good record of what was known about the problem. What we hoped at first was that the, the city would clamp down with regulations on that kind of noise. But it turned out that the city couldn't do anything because it was a provincial jurisdiction. And in fact, the gravel pits had been there before that part of the city was built. So this is something that I became aware of because of this example, that the bylaws only work if the city hasn't expanded beyond the point where it can be kept quiet. As cities expand, there are more and more possibilities for noise to intrude. One of the interesting things about the pandemic is that a lot of that mechanical noise calmed down for a while. And people started to notice, oh, we have birds out there. <laughs> yes, we have birds, we have rivers, we have rain, <laughs> all sorts of things that nobody hears in the city. So city soundscapes are you know, really complicated and we need to pay more attention to them. Another example comes from New York. And it was a case of gentrification of a neighborhood that, that had a lot of African immigrants and a large black population. So one of the customs in that neighborhood for decades was to have musicians, drummers and dancers and the instruments that accompany the drumming in traditional African music to have them in a park performing every Saturday. And people would come to listen, bring their kids, kids would be running around, dancers would come, people would bring their other instruments and join in. And it was really a, a great party for the whole neighborhood. Then a developer started building very high income buildings in the area, the gentrification project. And the people moving into those apartment buildings were a little put off by the sound of the drumming on Saturdays because they wanted to walk around the neighborhood listening to their own music or stay in their apartments and read or chat or do whatever they were doing and not hear the drums. So it became a conflict and there was a, a real back and forth online about it, which edged on some language that was kind of racist. So that, that became in itself an issue, how to get people to talk about their needs without blaming other people. And uh, you know, the, the dialogue online became a whole series of examples like, uh, I'm white, but I like the drumming, or I'm black, but I don't like the drumming. <laughs> so everybody was very careful to be polite, but the end result was that it was not entirely polite. But it did get worked out because the city, after a lot of, of pestering the city officials, the city designated an area further into the park for the drummers to meet every Saturday. And people could gather there as much as they wanted. And that way, there wasn't the constant pounding of drums near the apartment buildings. So yes, modifications can be worked out, locations can be worked out, people can cooperate and decide, okay, we're having a problem with this, let's solve it so that everybody is content. It can be done. And that, that particular case was a great example of that. Um, it's um, probably um, helpful for um, those who are in our audience and um, working with sound, making sound, uh, be they musicians or sound artists and 
that um uh no i think it's just for everyone to important to um know that um the way sound travels through a space too so if you had drummers below your uh apartment window on the street that can be quite loud but you know when you're in the city um you know with uh bricks concrete glass and so on the sound will bounce away in, in ways that will make the sound seem um at times louder from a distance than it is when it's closer and it's just because of the angle or the way um the, the physical behavior of sound where, where it can you know lower frequencies can refract or bend around a corner whereas the higher frequencies don't and tend to be more directional and things the physics of it in that um can really be impactful uh in terms of who is going to be within that circle of sound and so and also i always find it humorous where we um uh, sometimes resort to speaking about sound as if it were an object um and it has borders to it like a photo photographic frame around it it's like no no when it goes out it just goes where it's going to go depending on where the 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 architecture the building or the forest or what you know the landscape will uh help it go and so um so it, it doesn't stay contained and yet people will behave as if they're in their own bubble at times uh especially in social situations i'm thinking public transportation and things and um the cell phone the mobile phone conversations in public spaces or probably everyone's experienced this where you're you become a, a party to a a private conversation about things that maybe you shouldn't be hearing <laughs> so uh it can, it's it can be quite odd and i i think we could go on about stories but um um thinking about going on we have a finite amount of time maybe we should talk about um uh well what other points are there uh do you want to uh cover i mean we, we were thinking about the somatic nature of sound or um um the, the future maybe the future scenarios uh you had some interesting imaginary situations and if you want to talk about that perhaps and and then maybe we can take some questions uh from our listening audience uh before it gets too late Okay, another couple of quick readings. What I've done, besides all the science and all the sociology in here, I've, I've done a bit of speculative thinking and came up with some stories about what the past and the future might sound like. Uh, a series of little soundscape vignettes. So I'll give you an example of one. A community of hunter-gatherers in an arid or arctic climate. This is prehistory. The keynote is wind, dangerous weather, storms of dust, sand, or snow, is signaled by changes in the sound and feel and direction of the wind, favorable weather by its lesser intensity or absence. Human activity in the settlement is much like that in the tropical setting, but its resonance is muted and masked by the wind. The thuds and crunches of food preparation are almost constant. Because tree cover is less dense, bird calls are transitory rather than constant, and animals call at greater distances. People retreat into caves or tents or huts in harsh weather, and in winter sleep more than their tropical counterparts, huddle together so that the breaths and sighs and snores of the group are a large unconscious conversation. Ice creaks, squeaks, and groans in winter, clashes and sloshes in spring. Large prey animals moving in vast herds create distant thunder. Small ones scurry and click in grass and underbrush. Hunters and predators move in near silence, the sound of their movements masked by wind and rustling grass, or the hiss of moving sand. Because of the open terrain and the sounds of wind, Visitors or invaders approaching the community may be seen before they are heard. There are periods of relative quiet when only the wind is heard. Songs, like the wind, have limited melodic scope and long phrases. 
So that's one picture of prehistory and another one of a future situation, perhaps. And that will get us into how awareness of sound can help overcome capitalism if we happen to want to do that. Okay, this is a town or city council meeting, quite relevant to Calgary because we've just had a, an election for city council. In the evening, you attend a meeting at your community center. There is a contentious issue on the agenda and you have a strong opinion about it, as does everyone in the crowd that fills the hall and confronts the council members who sit in a row at the front of the room. It's about property taxes or parking regulations, business licenses, dog licenses, building permits, or access to recreational facilities. The issue has come up before and remained unresolved because opposing factions have not been willing to compromise. The issue has been declared unsuitable for definitive voting because opinion is evenly divided. You enter the room with some apprehension. Last time this subject was up for discussion, everyone left feeling frustrated. Before the meeting begins, two professional mediators walk in and sit in front of the council, gazing warmly at the crowd without speaking as a trio of musicians begins to play from the back of the hall. Instruments chase each other through quick spiraling phrases, then slow vibrant ones, then a single note held in pulse, fading into silence. The crowd is quiet. A mediator with a rich and deeply resonant voice instructs the crowd to consider the issue and its potential outcomes. Silence is held for three minutes while they do so. Discussion begins, bracketed by measured periods of music and silence. Faces in the crowd relax, heads nod, smiles appear. The second mediator, busy with a tablet computer through the discussion, projects and summarizes notes along with sketch diagrams of potential outcomes. Another break for silence is taken while the crowd and council consider results. A preliminary vote is taken by the council. Silence follows, then responses from the crowd. The mediators summarize and explain the implications of the result. The council votes again. Responses show that a large majority of the crowd is in agreement. A reasonable consensus has been achieved. Dissenters are respectfully told how and where they can register complaints, but few are expected. You smile at passing neighbors and leave the hall with a sense of relief. And if we look at the way that conflict is symbolized in our culture, quite typically, it's a matter of winning and losing. It's a war or it's sports. There has to be a winner, there has to be a loser. There's a dichotomy, two sides opposed to each other. So in the book, in the last chapter, what I've done is propose another model for how to deal with conflict, how to deal with really any kind of human interaction. Instead of setting up opposing sides, instead of using sports metaphors or war metaphors, what about using music, which requires cooperation? Bands, orchestras, choirs. It's not about outshouting each other. It's not about the trumpets drowning out the violins. It's about everybody knowing exactly when their sound is in there and when it's out playing the rests, okay? In music scores, you have notes to play and you have rests that tell you when not to play so that somebody else's sound can be heard. So I like to think of music as a good model for human interaction. And maybe if we work on models of cooperation more directly, we will be able to get over the cultural obsession with war and conflict. It might not be easy to do. It will take time, it will take discussion, it will take music lessons. Everybody learning what it is to 
to produce sound and to refrain from producing sound so that other sounds can be heard. It's what discussion is supposed to be like. And it's also the way that the natural world works. Bernie Krauss, who is a, a wonderful member of the acoustic ecology community, has been recording natural soundscapes for decades, since the 60s. He has a huge archive. And unfortunately, his studio was destroyed in a fire a couple of years ago, but there are enough copies around that a lot of it has been restored. So what he has done is present the recordings he did several decades ago, and then the recordings he's done recently in the same places. And what is absolutely shocking about the recent recordings is that a lot of the sound of nature, trees, birds, animals, is gone. Many fewer voices in the choir. So this is an indication in sound of the loss of species. And it's now being used in environmental science as a way of proving that there is species loss, that it's drastic, and that we need to really work on changing that. But this is where awareness of sound becomes both a science and a political issue. And I'm really hoping that all of you will take this and bring it out to your connections. Pay more attention, read more, listen more. And maybe we can turn this around. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Maisia. Yeah, if you would like to uh, uh, type a question into the chat, um, uh, I can try to read it uh, for Marcia, Marcia and uh, and we have one from JP, a question from this choral conductor. During this pandemic, choristers and conductors have been leery of singing together indoors. And yet to sing outdoors means that we can't necessarily experience the same beautiful resonance of our rehearsal halls. Uh, if you were going to take a choir out of doors just now, and you were in, in an urban setting and being the sound spec experts that you are, had some knowledge of how sound behaves around certain substances, such as glass, grit, uh, concrete, brick, metal, et cetera. What types of spaces would you investigate with your 23 voice choir to help them enjoy their best chance to hear each other, but uh, still allow air to circulate well? Um, inquiring minds would <laughs> want to know. Yeah. Well, this is from Jane Perry, who is the conductor of a choir I sing with. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, what we want in that circumstance is a building with a large wall behind us and some shelter from the wind, because that can carry the sound away very easily, <laughs> as we've already experienced. And, well, ideal would be a large courtyard surrounded by buildings with large facades and nothing at odd angles. It, it should be it's kind of an enclosed square so that it's, it's like an area that will bounce the sound back at us, but not chaotically. There must be some place downtown, some little park surrounded by buildings that will work for that. And of course, outdoor rehearsals in Calgary are limited by snow. So we're waiting to find out how that pans out. Yeah, but it's interesting. <laughs> okay, and then there's, there's another one here. Um, okay. Yes, from one of my former students. One assignment, yes, sound walking, right? We need to get to sound walking. This is something that I assign to students in my class on how sound communicates in the communication studies department at U of Calgary. And it's interesting because what I do is send them out with the instructions, walk for 20 minutes or half an hour or longer if you want, with no earbuds, no earphones, 
no talking, just walk and listen and make notes and everybody turns in a little essay about what they heard. So what, what got really interesting a couple of years ago with this class was that people started to report that it was the first time they had gone for a walk without earbuds or earphones in. And that kind of shocked me. <laughs> and it's been consistent since. A lot of the students report that they just were not accustomed to going for walks outdoors without some kind of music. And, you know, it's great to walk with music, but you miss so much. The, the world outside of, of your awareness is talking to you all the time. And we need to, to hear that. We need to be able to converse with the natural world and even the mechanical world in the city. We need to know what it's saying. So by all means, walk without anything transmuting music into your ears, at least some of the time. Uh, taking a dog with you counts as walking solo. So yeah, if you listen to the, the clink of the, the harness tags or the clicking of nails, that, that's wonderful. That's a cheery sound. I might to add my perspective on that too, if I may, because I've been leading sound walks um, um, in the the manner that Hildegard Westerkamp has been doing it. And, uh, and I always like to promote or advocate for what she's done and what she's written about, uh, not just about sound walks, but in soundscape composition and so many other things. But um, I like um, organizing a sound walk, you know, planning a route, um, and uh, uh, convening a group to do it together and having the group go together. And then at the end, the, the key part is, you know, doing the things that you mentioned, Marcia, you know, you just like, just not talk, but just open your ears up to all of the different sounds that you can possibly catch and where they're coming from and how they shift and how they move through the space around you. And it's incredible how much information there is and that, and also human humor um, and serendipitous events occur. It's like, oh, someone says something and in in in, you know, just by chance, it, 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 cause, it seems as if it causes some other sound to occur. And, you know, it's so like, oh, funny, that's, you know, and, the, and it's just, there's so many things that we, you just surprise you about it. But maybe that's just what I thought. And so at the end, you have everyone say a few words, gather in that circle. And so you can all, as co-equals, say like, well, what do you remember? What stood out for you about that? Um, or was there something that bothered you? Or, you know, and just get feedback, any feedback you know, that they, anyone wants to share about their experience. And, you know, so, and someone will start telling about what their experience was is like, and it's like, wow, I didn't even hear that. What is it? Oh, that was oh, what, interesting. So, and, but that group sharing experience is so indicative of how, we hear differently um, and yet uh, can appreciate, um, uh, you know, to use that term from Schaefer, the music of the environment, that there's just a lot to enjoy. And you don't need to put loudspeakers into the, into the, uh, the recipe uh, or earbuds. Uh, it's just the world is giving it to you. Uh, you just have to pay attention. Uh, so. Um, group sound walking is, is also wonderful. I normally do it, but COVID put a stop to that for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, also things people say in passing or, or the sounds from, from trees or, or from whatever will remind you of things. So I, I also ask the students to put in any memories that come up and they're quite mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This um, is a whole area of awareness that, that we need to practice. There's a question from Leslie Robinson, who I, I imagine is local to Calgary. And, 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 and Leslie asks, Calgary is filled with empty buildings. How can we use them for healing and making joyful sounds together? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. And it applies anywhere. 
all those office buildings that aren't occupied right now. And uh, the rents are probably down. So let a group together and something. Yeah. Some of them might become great performance spaces. I think architects and city planners, musicians, sound artists, um, uh, dancers are, are all sensitive to different aspects of our spatial environment and the, the, the built environment. And so the, from those perspectives, um, uh, if one were maybe a kind of generalist, you could reach out to them and see how you could put to something together. And then um, there's also the process of identifying particular places, you know, like, uh, and getting the city involved. Um, maybe there's a, a cultural program the city offers to, uh, that would support that. Yeah. yeah well, the pandemic has, has given us all this space and maybe a little bit of extra time. It would be a great opportunity for starting programs for giving children access to the arts. All kinds of programs can be worked out, and it, it doesn't even take a huge amount of space. Yeah, yeah. Or a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those ear cleaning exercises you don't require any technology. A, a sheet of paper. Okay, a sheet of paper. That's about as high tech as it got, I think. Um, and uh, I think the one was to to take the paper and tear it and listen as you tear it uh, and then pass the piece to another part of your group. And, and, and then it was sort of listening to it. And I think, I don't know if that's the full exercise, but it was just simple things like that. And then, and then someone would maybe use their voice to repeat the sound of that tearing. And then you begin to realize it's like, each sound is so different and it's a simple same gesture, but never the same. Uh, so uh, just simple things like that as an example. And children once, can understand it quite quickly. Yeah. I was once at lunch in a, a small Chinese restaurant and uh, it was outside the usual lunchtime. So our group was the only one there. And we started picking up the silverware and Clanging softly on the glasses and tapping on the table, and yes. setting up <laughs> counterpoint percussion. It was wonderful. And the, you know, the staff came out and, and were grinning at us, <laughs> listening to everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I highly recommend that as an exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we can, I agree, Leslie, we can be the change we wish to hear in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, Pamela Ricky um, put a question. I can't understand how people enjoy going out for dinner or drinks to places where the music is so loud they can't hear each other. You know, speaking. I mean, speaking to each other. So, do you think it's uh, because they have lost the art of conversation? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, the art of conversation is certainly discouraged in a lot of public places. Yeah, and. Um, it might be because a lot of people feel self-conscious about talking with people they don't know very well. So if it's a, a group or you know, a couple, if, if it's, for example, a, a date early in the process where they don't know each other very well and they feel self-conscious, um, you know, both the glass of wine and the music will, will help with relaxing. But there's more to it than that, I think. Um, that's a really good question. Mm. Yeah. Eric, do yeah. you have anything on that? Um, yeah, I have a few, a few thoughts. Um, okay. um, the loud sound level um, is, um, I've noticed myself, uh, a real deterrent. And as I'm getting older, I notice my, um, my ability to uh, uh, um, uh, speech intelligibility is diminished because I'm losing the high frequencies uh, in my hearing, especially in my right ear. I actually went and got it tested uh, back in August. So I have a, a chart to prove it. Um, but, um, and then when background noise is present, it, it, it adds to the, the difficulty. And uh, so in, in a noisy restaurant where there's background uh, 
mus uh, music. And if you want to use a, uh, a, a, a term to describe sound, uh, what happens is, is the Lombard effect, uh, which means that um, when you have one sound and then um, let's say you'd like to speak and be heard, you have to speak at a higher level than the present sound. Well, if it's music being uh, played through loudspeaker in the restaurant, and and today almost every restaurant won't consider itself such without having loudspeakers playing music. If I walk into a restaurant without music, I'll be going, wow, write that down and let the world know about it. But anyways, um, so yeah, so that's one person speaking over the noise level, but then you get another and they're talking to each other and they're both above the noise level. And then some other people uh, in the room are speaking and they, they're, but the room is such in the construction of the room makes a difference. Um, they, they get a little higher and then the other group gets higher and higher and higher. And then it's just like, and it's just a blowout and everyone is just shouting. And I've been in restaurants where um, I came out and I'm going, um, I'm feeling kind of in my chest. It was like, was I shouting for a long time? And I think maybe I was. And so, uh, so that's a kind of a negative effect of it. But um, you know what you can do? You can ask the manager of the restaurant or your, your wait person um, if they can turn it down. And hopefully they'll respect that uh, because you're a paying customer yeah. and they want you to come back, right? Also, I noticed restaurants are, um, are at least there's a rating system for restaurants. And I was pleased to see that sound was a new um, measure of the quality of a, a restaurant. Uh, it's not just the, the flavor of the food and how well the service is, uh, also the sound is because it's so prevalent. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I don't go into places that are that loud. And that, that's another way to handle the situation. You get in there, it's too loud. You tell them it's too loud. I'm leaving. Yeah. After paying your bill, of course. Yeah. yeah. So the more people draw attention to it, the more it has a chance of changing. And there are soundproofing techniques, and even some new ones that involve sound absorption, that would be really helpful in restaurants. And some of them in the larger cities in North America are starting to use those technologies. I don't think they've hit Calgary yet, but we should look into it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe they're in use in some restaurants and I'm not aware of it because uh, um, uh, a colleague of mine said it's, you know, one form of noise reduction uh, the, with sound with materials um, can, can be simply through um, adding a, an absorbent material underneath the table. So you don't, it's out of sight, uh, but it's still active in, or having a, uh, uh, an effect by reducing reflected sound, which can add to the, um, uh, the way it, uh, the sound propagates in the room. Uh, electronic methods now as well. They're expensive, mm -hmm. but eventually yeah. the price will come down. Um, so uh, let's see. And so... Uh, uh, Colin Robertson added uh, that in regards to Pamela's question. I know I love places with loud music, um, uh, but uh, 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 to just lose myself within the music and, and then with other people, and we don't need to talk anymore, but, but we're just feeling the vibe of the music overpowering us, like at a concert or live music. And um, yeah, and I think we have to respect um, there's different ways you want to uh, be together uh, and it doesn't need to be in a conversational setting. So um, I think there's a, a lot of different ways. Um, but um, yeah, uh, although at a restaurant, I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, anyways, um, you know, when you're sitting at a table to eat and converse, you know, it, that would be another setting. So uh, definitely. Um, so uh, I wonder too whether it changes the taste of the food if the background is very loud. I, I think there is somebody studying that. Yeah, um, um, there's evidence in studies I've read uh, a bit about that do have, relate those to one another. That there is a measurable 
difference. So, um, but, uh, and um, here's uh, one from uh, Dorothy uh, about uh, audio awareness and sound environment and the uh, deliberate hygiene with quotes around it um, has improved greatly since I started reading Marcia's book. Um, yay. <laughs> um, and more precisely, it was being read out loud to me. Uh, so another aspect of sensory interaction changes in vision due to medication, making it difficult for me to read paper or screen text. Uh, so so uh, Dorothy says, uh, it's quite, wonderful that these ideas about our audio experiences can be shared like this uh, in an interactive way. So, uh, and the book is so enjoyable, well-written, and um, and it works as an audio book. So anyway, I didn't know that, but that's good to know. So, because I think, you know, writing for speech and writing for print are, are different things. So if it can translate in, into both, that's wonderful. Um, so that's a, a thank you to you, Marcia. And thank you right back. And thanks to everyone here. <laughs> Maybe I should contact the publisher about approaching audiobooks at some point. Yeah. That's an idea. <laughs> we'll see where this Good goes. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're uh, going on um, uh, uh, half past the hour. Uh, um, uh, do we have any more questions? Or uh, I see uh, Jesse Roy. Um, has a question uh, and um, mentions that uh, uh, I've read a couple studies about how the noise level affects the taste of food and also how long di diners will stay. Unfortunately, some restaurants are using these st those studies to justify louder sound levels mm -hmm. to increase the numbers of tables that are served in the same time frame. Mm -hmm. hmm. They want to chase people out. Jesse is an uh, acoustic engineer, so <laughs> okay. that's what this is about. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, well, yeah, there are you know different, uh, I guess, uh, business models where um, if it's fast food, you just want to get get them in and out quickly. Whereas other restaurants might be the the old European style where you or you know that I've experienced where you can enjoy the the dinner and being together at a table for as long as you want or at least until the wet restaurant closes um so um leslie likes the idea of an audiobook too so um it would be good um yeah um well um perhaps um we're at the point where we can um uh, make our, our closing, I, I don't think I have a closing comment. Um, well, I can make endless comments, I feel, but uh, is there anything you want to tell us about, Marcia, that's coming up uh, regarding um, the book or, well, you have you have a new assignment to ask about an audio book, but uh, <laughs> events that are going on that you'd like to, to uh, share with us? None that are planned so far. I'm, I'm waiting to find out if other bookstores want to do launches in other cities because now that they're being done online, that's easy. Yeah. yeah. So if any of you in the audience are from other places and want to have this kind of thing done where you live, mm -hmm. arrange it with, with an independent bookstore and I will be there on Zoom. Great. Um, and I'll, I'll mention, you know, because of my my efforts with the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology and the Midwest Society for Acoustic Ecology, um, you know, a, a, a group in, based in Chicago, but also connected with um, uh, other uh, cities and, and uh, um, uh, activists, researchers, teachers, artists in the Midwest region. Um, conferences are a great way to um, uh, have conversations like this, um, whether they're online conferences or in person. So um, I would encourage people to check out the websites for both of those groups um, mm -hmm. and um, stay tuned uh, on what, what else is going on in the world of acoustic ecology and soundscape studies. Um, and so um, 
uh, shelf life books has shared the uh, URL to the book where you can get it uh, and right in the shop uh, or uh, make a purchase online. So uh, that's great. Um, so um, I'm sure we'll, we'll make connections. And it's my understanding that this conversation will be um, has been recorded and will be posted on the YouTube channel for Shelf Life Books too. So uh, that'll hopefully happen within a, a few weeks or so, I suppose. So, um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, Marcia, it's been uh, wonderful to talk with you in real time. We've never done this before. Uh, so um, I really appreciate it. I appreciate um, you reaching out to me to invite me to do this in, uh, interview. So again, I'm, I'm really honored. So uh, yeah, I'm and honored that you agreed to do it. Thank and you. I, I might think of an excuse to get to Chicago to one of your group meetings. Yeah, do let me know. Do let me know if you're coming to town and uh, they're happening. we'll make it special. Yeah, <laughs> great. Okay, well, um, thank you Shelf Life Books and Marcia. Have a nice evening.